and welcome to part four of the beginning of the end. Um, this is our last chapter on ecosystems, and for the next lecture, we're going to talk more about um, global patterns of species diversity and what influences them. But today, we're going to talk about coastal wetland ecosystems. Um, before I get into that, though, I wanted to show you some of my pets. <laughs> uh, so these are just some videos I recorded yesterday of some of my favorite animals that are in my aquarium and they live in coastal ecosystems normally if they're not in my fish tank. So this is, come on, this is a video of one of the cute little nudibranchs that I ordered for my fish tank to eat up the invasive sea anemones in the tank. And if you look at these dark projections on um, the dark parts of the little projections on their body, that is where they store the stinging nematocysts of the anemones. And then they use the nematocysts that they eat for defense. This little one's less than a centimeter long. So I was zoomed in on my phone to take that video. Um, this is a cool guy. This is a type of amphipod called a skeleton shrimp because they kind of look like little skeletons. They have little raptorial forearms for eating things. I don't know what that is. I have to figure it out. But this thing's about a centimeter long as well, hiding in that little hole. That's his eyeball. He has little antennae. And you can see he has like little raptorial forearms like a praying mantis for catching prey items. This is an amphipod. I didn't put this in the tank. It just kind of grew Probably there were amphipod eggs on the rocks and other things that I put in there, and then they grew as well. He go in hidey hole. This is another kind of amphipod called a side swimmer. Um, these are all over the tank. Again, I didn't put them in there on purpose. They were probably eggs on the rocks I put in there. And then now I have a population of amphipods um, in here. These little dots, those are copepods that I talked about in the last lecture. So lots of diversity in my aquarium. And then this, this is a creepy clam worm. Kind of pretty, it's like kind of rainbow. Look at the little eye spots on the front of his head. It's all bristly. What a weird worm, huh? Creepy. They mostly are nocturnal, so they come out, they'll scavenge all the like um, meat and stuff that's left over after I feed my crabs, so they help with nutrient cycling in the tank. And they also like stir up the sediment on the bottom by digging through the sand. Creepy. Okay. Those are animals that live in coastal environments. So same with the three ecosystem lectures um, for the one, two, th six that we're going to talk about today. Um, I'd like you to be able to recall um, each of these five points. And again, I may not explicitly say them, so you may have to do a little research on your own to come up with these lists for each of these six ecosystems. Hopefully I'll cover most of them though. Let's talk about intertidal zones. Um, intertidal zones are on beaches. Um, they're alternately submerged and exposed by the tides. Um, this is where all the little dudes in my aquarium live in nature. They live in intertidal zones on the coast of Florida. Um, between the extremes of low tide and high tide, conditions can change in these environments hourly. Like, if you've ever been to the beach, you'll know that these environments fluctuate highly throughout the day. So, you gotta be a tough will cookie, or even like, you know, a sand dollar, <laughs> to live in these environments. Um, most of the organisms that reside here are marine organisms because they're very highly saline. And they're, but they're adapted to withstand some degree of exposure to the air for varying periods of time. So um, those amphipods that live in my tank, not so much adapted to being exposed. Um, I guess the sea slugs can kind of crawl up um, and cover themselves when they're exposed to the air. But that this stuff would, like the stuff I just showed you in the previous video, that would be more like um, areas where that would really only live in low tide environments. But, you know, clams, they like to live in higher tide environments because they can close up and uh, prevent them from desiccation. 
So there's a, a lot of stratification in um, intertidal zones. Let's first talk about some stratification that you see in rocky shorelines. So we're going to talk about sandy shorelines versus rocky shorelines. Um, and you get three basic zones within rocky shorelines. So, um, and then two main fringes at the borders between those zones. So you have the terrestrial zone, which is um, the top here. This is, or the sup super littoral zone, or the super tidal zone. So this is the area um, that is, it will get spray from the ocean. So it will be slightly saline, but it's never really ever submerged. Um, that's the, f the first part as you go into the water. Um, then you have the super littoral fringe between the super littoral zone and the littoral zone. Um, in the super littoral zone, you can have this black zone, which is what is pictured here. Um, so this is obviously a low tide. This is um, a thin layer of something called Calothrix cyanobacteria that grows on the rocks there. Uh, and that's what this black material is that grows in this fringe. Um, this is the first major change. The super littoral fringe is the first major change from the terrestrial environment. In here, you really only get salt water every two weeks in the spring tides, but not really any other time. Um, the other th things besides the calothrix cyanobacteria that you can get growing here, which makes it black, is you can also have um, Entophallus green algae, Verrucaria lichens, um, and other things above the high tide water line. So they live in association with the ocean, but they don't live in this that highly saline water. Um, if you've ever been to the beach and you've been walking around on the rocks and they're really, really slippy um, before you get to like the ocean proper, that's because of um, this cyanobacteria, algae, and lichen that grow um, in the super littoral fringe. Also in the black zone, you get various herbivores that, that are associated with um, the algae that grow there. Um, one example are these Litterina snails that feed on that black algae. So lots of, mostly just snails and then um, coastal algae like this uh, Calothrix cyanobacteria. And then you have the littoral zone or the intertidal zone. This area is covered and uncovered daily by the tides of the region. You get lots of barnacles in the upper reaches of this area. Um, you, this is where you also get oysters, mussels, and limpets. Um, which, if you take my invertebrate zoology class, you'll get to learn all about them in lab because we have a massive shell collection in the department of mysterious origin. I still can't figure out where they're from. Um, and you get a lot of uh, shelled mollusks uh, and gastropods, like which are types of mollusks. Um, you get lots of shelled mollusks living in the littoral zone because they're able to close their shell or push down onto the rock and prevent their soft body from desiccation. So that's why you see barnacles, oysters. Well, barnacles are actually crustacea, um, but oysters and mussels, uh, those are mollusks. Um, you can also, the some uh, autotrophic vegetation that you can get in the littoral zone are different kinds of rock weeds and then a brown algae called rack that lives in the lower half. So you'll get like, Barnacles in the upper part that is uh, less covered by water. In the middle lower, in the middle and lower portions, which are more covered by water, you get like oysters, mussels, and limpets. And then in the lower part, along with them, you, that's where you start to get uh, brown algae. And then you have the fringe between the littoral zone and the infralittoral zone, and this is the infralittoral fringe. Um, this is uncovered only at the spring tides. Uh, and this is where you get laminaria, which is that really large, floaty brown algae, um, like this. That's laminaria. Uh, that's where you can have uh, this predominance is in the infralittoral fringe. And then the bottom part of the shoreline is the marine zone or the subtidal zone. 
Um, and this is almost never exposed, completely exposed, uh, but it is very shallow water. Uh, so then you get uh, different communities of organisms that live there. So let's talk a little more about the organisms that live in some of these areas that are illustrated here. Um, you also, besides having different communities living in the different zones, you can also get different um, organisms living in waves and in pools of the ocean. So in the waves, um, as waves come in to the shorelines, they bring in a steady supply of nutrients and they wash away any organic material. So they are important for uh, nutrient cycling in shoreline environments, the waves are from the tides. Um, they keep the fronds of the seaweed that grow, um, like the laminaria, in constant motion. So um, there's even uh, exposure to sunlight for all of the plant. Um, they dislodge plants and invertebrates from rocks so that you have lots of new colonization happening all the time. So if something can't hunker, hunker down on the rock, then it might get washed out to sea and then other organisms can move in and colonize that area. And then really heavy waves um, will reduce the activity of starfish and sea urchin predators. So if something like some sort of artificial wall is built, um, sometimes you can get overpopulations of starfish and sea urchins um, predominating um, because they're not being reduced by heavy wave activity. In the pools, so where you do get a barrier and water will collect, um, these pools um, can keep some of that water. And at low tide, the pools are subject to wide and sudden fluctuations in temperature, in salinity, and pH. Um, so like tide pools, um, they while they do, even at low tide, still have water, the amount of water that's in them is going to change. Evaporation is going to be really high at low tide, which is then going to make that pool more saline. Uh, it'll also change the pH, and the shallower it is, the more that water will warm up. And so pools, tide pools, fluctuate a lot in temperature. These are just a few animals that uh, I saw at um, a tide pool I visited last summer with my family in California. Um, Look at this little crab. This is during low tide, obviously, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to stand out there and look at them. But he can move around and adjust his position to be more or less in the water based on temperature and salinity. Uh, there are a lot of anemones that grow in tide pools. And what they do at low tide is that they can close around themselves. So this isn't, you know, normally if you think of an anemone, its tentacles are all out and it'll expose them. These are both uh, anemones that have closed up to prevent desiccation or, um, uh, you know, physiological changes because of an increase in salinity. They are able to close up around themselves. Um, and then this is a chitin, which you also learn about in my invertebrate zoology class. These are little um, mollusks that can attach themselves to hard surfaces. There's like a fleshy foot underneath this shell and so during low tide they just kind of like hunker down on the rock and prevent their fleshy tissue underneath this um, from desiccation. And there's snails, you know, other, um, that looks like an olive snail, nerite shell or something. I'm not super great with <laughs> the, the, the twirly snails, but I'm pretty sure that's an olive shell. Um, Anyway, you'll learn about those in Invert Zoe if you take that class. Um, let's talk about some other organisms that live in these different zones. So um, up here in the terrestrial or the supertidal zone, you uh, we already talked about that, but down here um, in some of these other zones. Oh, so there's that, that black layer that we were talking about that's in the superlatoral fringe here. Um, and then we talked about how like it, the the first organisms you start to see in like the tidal zones proper are barnacles, which are crustacea, they're weird, um, and some periwinkles and other snails that might be associated with the cyanobacteria in the black zone, um, whelks, more periwinkles down here that are associated with um, the laminaria and the other algae and the moss that grow here, um, 
crabs tend to be, so this was like a tide pool that was a little closer to the tidal zone. Um, you tend to get crabs down here so that they can run back into the waters if they need to get desic if they're at risk of desiccation. And then the starfish, obviously, is a they can't do very well if they make it out all the way up here and they don't end up in a tide pool, so they tend to stay down here uh, with the laminaria kelp. Um, anything else? Oh, yeah, rockweed. We talked about the rockweed. Yeah, that's it. Um, so that was rocky shorelines. Now let's talk about uh, sandy and muddy shorelines, which have very similar... Um, stratifications and zones. Um, it's just they're not, uh, they're more gradual because they're sandy. Um, sandy shorelines are produced by the weathering of rock that then creates the sand. Um, the size of the sand that's on that beach is going to determine the water retention during low tide and the ability of the animals that live in the that environment to burrow in it. Um, beach that beaches that are have gradual slopes rather than steeper slopes um, will sometimes have organic material that settles from the water and so they'll get kind of muddy rather than sandy so usually if you have a sandy beach um, it's because the water is able to wash in and and push out some of the organic material back into the ocean muddy beaches like where these mud skippers are hee <laughs> look at how fighting uh, you tend to get that because there's a gradual slope and so the water is not washing out all the organic material and it's creating like a humic muddy layer on top of the sand. Um, you can have epifauna, infauna, and myofauna in the sandy and muddy shorelines. Um, epifauna are organisms that live on the sediment surface. Also they live above the sediment. Infauna are organisms living in the sediments. A lot of infauna um, will occupy permanent or semi-permanent tubes in the sand or mud. And they're able to burrow rapidly into that substrate. So um, mud skippers, which we talked about earlier, are a really great example of that. We talked about their U-shaped um, egg depositing holes, ovipositing holes. No, they don't ovipositing their fish. Um the, the U-shaped holes that they lay their eggs in, that's um, one example of infauna or mud skippers. Another example are these um, coquinas. Um, they have they can have like really diverse uh, colors uh, in their shells. This is like the typical shell shape. They're pretty small, about like a little longer than maybe the length of your thumbnail. Um, and what they do, if you've ever been to the beach, you might have seen them doing this, um, is that they, they're capable of burrowing into the sand. A lot of um, mollusks are um, able to do that, that they have like a foot that they extend out of their shell and then they use it to burrow a hole into the sand. This is a really upsetting scene of all of them coming out of the sand together to spawn with each other, which is really gross and weird. I've only ever really seen them doing like I've seen an individual one burrowing itself in the sand with its foot. Uh, this is a little more disturbing to see coquinas doing this, but I like them. I think their shells are pretty and cute. And then, so those are infauna um, that live in the sediments, um, and but they, they'll burrow inside of it and sometimes will come out to the surface. And then there's myofauna. These are organisms that are between 0.05 to 0.5 millimeters. And this includes things like copepods, ostracods, nematodes, gastrox, uh, ga gastrix. Um, they also bury into the substrate because if they lay on top of the sand during low tide, they'll get desiccated. So, um... I didn't include a picture of any copepods from my tank, but they would be myofauna that live in sandy and muddy shorelines. So, um, in sandy and muddy shorelines, um, you see a little less stratification than you see in rocky shorelines just because the uh, topography of a sandy beach versus a rocky is going to create less stratification. It's going to be more gradual. So in the upper beach areas, the super littoral areas, 
you're going to get things like uh, ghost crabs and beach hoppers. Um, I can't remember what kind of crabs these are anymore. Um, in the littoral or the intertidal areas, um, you're going to get things like starfish, this, sand dollars, which are sometimes also called sea cookies, which I think it's really cute. I just learned about that last year. So echinoderms. Um, and then other brewing um, animals like mole crabs, which I think are really, really cool. That's a mole crab. Um, oh, this is a sand flea. It's actually a crustacean, if you've ever heard of sand fleas. Uh, I don't remember what these cuties are, but they're cute, huh? Um, oh, I'm, I'm getting to them. Never mind. Hold on. <laughs> okay, so... Um, in the littoral and intertidal range, you don't have as drastic fluctuations in temperature and salinity as there are on rocky shorelines, just because it's more gradual. Um, and then near and below low tide is where you get um, predatory gastropods, um, other species of crabs. That's where you get mole crabs is in low tide, um, clams. Um, these organisms will actually move back and forth with the tides along the beaches and um, associated with them are their predators so gulls and shorebirds um, will hunt where the tide recedes because they're feeding on um, mole crabs, other crabs, clams, um, and predatory gastropods. Uh, I have a predatory gastropod that lives in my fish tank i think have i shown you guys gary the snail well he's a predatory crown conch snail and uh he has this really upsetting tube mouth that's like a big creepy worm that he like everts from his body when he eats and so normally he would eat like clams and he'll like dig a hole through their shell and suck out their juices but i usually just feed him cubes of uh beef it's really gross to watch them eat anyway predatory snail gastropods live near or below low tide and sandy muddy shorelines so that's it for shorelines now let's talk about salt marshes um salt marshes occur in temperate latitudes where coastlines are protected from the action of waves within estuaries or deltas and by barrier islands and dunes and the structure of these is going to be again like shorelines dictated by tides and by salinity uh, in low marsh areas which again are uh, more covered by water and less exposed to the air you get things growing like um, salt marsh uh, cord grass where's that there we go salt marsh cord grass spartina um, Spartina, is, we, we've actually talked about these before, they have a high tolerance for salinity um, and they're able to live in a semi-submerged state. Um, their roots are buried in anaerobic mud and then they have these hollow tubes um, that lead from the leaf to the root um, through which oxygen diffuses because there's no oxygen available in the mud where their roots are, which is a really cool adaptation to being submerged in salt water. Uh, in mid-marsh um, you'll get a different species or um, yeah you'll still get Spartina growing in there uh, maybe a different species of Spartina. Um, there's a higher salinity in the mid-marsh because it's when the water when the water washes out during lower tide areas uh, the water that's left will evaporate and then it leaves behind the salt that was in the water when the water evaporates so it, is, it tends to have a higher salinity and it also has a decreased input of nutrients um, from a lower tidal exchange um, so you can get spartina growing here too but they have higher salinity tolerances uh, and then you can also get plants like glassworts uh, sea lavender, um, a plant called spear scale, another plant called sea blight, and these are all plants that have higher tolerances for salinity versus um, salt marsh cordgrass because salt marsh cordgrass, even though it's more 
covered um, with water, it doesn't have these periodic drying outs that then leave salt crusts around. Um, and then in high marsh, again, um, you also get cord grass, but you get uh, different species of cord grass, and then you also get something called salt grass. Um, you can see some of the different species that, oh yeah, it's here's salt grass that lives in the high marsh areas. So you get different plant species um, that are stratified in these different zones. We talked about this when we talked about zonation. You get different species, um, and it's mostly stratified based on that individual plant species uh, salt tolerance. Within marshes, you can get salt pans and salt creeks. Salt pans are circular to elliptical depressions that are flooded during high tide periods. Um, so they're like little, it's kind of like, it's like the salt marsh version of a tide pool, but it's called a salt pan. Um, so they remain filled with salt water during low tide, just like tide pools do. Um, but also just like tide pools, they are highly fluctuate in salinity because if that water evaporates the salts stay behind and in a salt pan they can create a salt f flat so it's like a crusty little depression that's in the salt marsh um you can also have salt creeks which are uh, drainage channels that will carry tidal waters back out to sea from salt marshes um, and the exposed banks of salt creeks can support things like mud algae, which also grows in um, the high tide regions of rocky shorelines, but they can also have uh, diatoms and dinoflagellates that also live in the salt creeks. So that is salt marshes. Now let's talk about mangroves. Um, Mangroves, mangrove forests, tend to replace salt marshes in tropical regions. They cover 60 to 75% of the coastline of tropical regions. And they will develop where there's a lack of wave action, um, where sediments are going to be able to accumulate, um, and thus with the sediments, organic matter and material, and the muds there are then, because of the lack of wave action and cycling, the muds there are anoxic. They don't have oxygen in them because they're not being disturbed. They are dominated by mangroves, which, fun fact, is not a single species of plants. Mangroves is more of like a evolutionary classification of plants because there are eight different families and 12 different genera of plants that are called mangroves that all develop this mangrove phenotype that is a unique evolutionary adaptation to um, coastal environments. Really cool. Mangroves are super cool. I think we talked about them in my evolution class. We should definitely talk more about them because they're weird and I like them. Um, so they're dominated by mangroves, mangrove areas are, surprise, and also, um, but it's not just mangroves, you can also get salt tolerant shrubs that grow in um, these mangrove ecosystems. So let's talk about what mangroves are. Like I said, they are very speciose. A lot of them are not actually even phylogenetically related to each other. It's just a, there's very strong selection in these environments for the phenotype of a mangrove. So let's talk about what that actual phenotype is. Um, they all have shallow, wide-spreading roots. That's what you see going on here next to this burb, is wide, shallow, spreading roots. Um, many of them have prop roots that come from the trunk and limbs. So the ones that are on the outside, those are the prop. These are actually this whole structure here is the prop root that supports it because these uh, soils are very muddy and don't have a lot of structural uh, stability. And one really cool thing that is, again, another example of convergent evolution are their pneumatophores. So they have root extensions that take in oxygen for the roots because, like I said, the muds in mangrove ecosystems are anoxic there's no oxygen down there so the roots have extensions um, a lot like a uh, salt marsh cord grass that extend up and take oxygen into the roots uh, from the above the mud 
Um, a lot of herons, this is an egret, herons and egrets are some of the bird species that live in mangrove habitats. Um, snails and oysters and barnacles will also live there. Um, fiddler crabs um, can also live there. Fiddler crabs uh, and other land crabs, they tend to be scavengers in these environments. And then, of course, mud skippers live there too because, um, well, they live on muddy beaches, right, that we said that have gradual slopes that allow for the buildup of organic material. Mangroves, because, again, they don't have that wave action, you get an accumulation of sediment and mud, and then mud skippers can live there too and fight each other for mates. Okay, I'm, I love mud skippers. Now, so that concludes our salt water coastal ecosystems. Now let's talk about the freshwater kind, um, which you've been in around Winnie Palmer, stomping around. Um, freshwater wetlands are very diverse. Um, they cover 6% of Earth's surface and they're found in every climatic zone, um, but are very local in occurrence. So. They're very small. We see this all, well, I guess the wetlands, the monastery run improvement wetlands are not a great example because they're artificial. They're not natural. Um, but Spruce Flats Bog, which we didn't go to, but is very close to campus is an example one. Um, there are a few expansive versions, so they tend to be very small, but the, the really big ones uh, are ones like the Everglades. Everglades is a classic example of one of very few large wetlands in the world. Um, and then this is just um, some pictures of the zonation that occur in wetlands, which we've talked a little bit about before, um, and you have also seen, um, is that you have like um, the upland areas where you get a diversity of different tree species, highly saturated soils. Um, then you have the wetland proper, which varies in um, water saturation based on rainfall. And um, if you have heavy rains, these can, you can get saturation up to here. If uh, you have a drought period, then you're pretty much only getting open water down here. So let's talk about some things that grow there and live there. Um, associated with wetlands are things called hydrophytic plants. Hydrophytic plants are a plants that are adapted to grow in water or on soil that is periodically anaerobic or deprived of oxygen because of the excess water. So when the excess water builds up, it creates an anoxic or anaerobic environment. Um, and the hydrophytic plants are adapted to grow in water or on, in soil that is like that. Um, let's talk about some different types of hydrophytic plants. Um, you can have obligate wetland plants. These are species of plants that require saturated soils. So this would include things like pond lilies, um, cattails, cattails um, bulrushes. One of my favorite wetland species are bald cypress because they have these really cool buttress roots, which we've talked about earlier. They just like look very prehistoric and they kind of are. Um, I love them. They're obligate wetland species. Um, you have facultative wetland species. These grow in either saturated or upland soil, but they rarely grow anywhere else, um, which means they're really helpful for identifying where wetland is. Uh, this will include things like sedges and alders, but it also actually includes um, red maples and cottonwoods. Red maples require very saturated soil, so unless um, you have very wet soil, you can't uh, really grow maples, they'll die from not having enough water availability or from saturated soils. Um, and then you have occasional wetland species. So occasional wetland species are usually found um, out of wetland environments, um, but they can tolerate wetlands. And you guys should be familiar with these. Obviously, this one I know you're familiar with. Goldenrod is actually an example of an occasional wetland species. And so is uh, Echinacea, purple coneflower. Um, this group in particular is critical to determining the upper limit of a wetland along a gradient of soil moisture. So wet, there's a lot of um, regulation and conservation of wetlands because they are um, 
very endangered habitats worldwide. And so being able to identify, a lot of identification of a wetland is based on the plant species that grow there. And then beca because of the um, soil moisture gradient that is in a wetland, you can use the soil moisture gradient to identify where a wetland begins and ends. So you use occasional wetland species like echinacea and goldenrod to tell you where the end of that wetland is and then terrestrial environment begins. And there are three main topographic situations in which wetlands occur. So like I said, you can only have wetlands unless you have some sort of depression where water can gather during rainflow. So let's talk about these three main types. You can have uh, basin wetlands. These are uh, shallow basins. Um, water flow in basin wetlands is vertical as a result of rainfall and the downward infiltration of water into the soil. So um, fens, cars, and bogs are all examples of basin wetlands. So they're formed by a depression and then the water that comes into it is um, vertical from precipitation. You can also have riverine, riverine wetlands. Um, these are shallow and periodically flooded um, banks of rivers and streams. The water flow in these is going to be unidirectional because it's coming from the river and then, um, but it's also based on precipitation because obviously uh, the water levels in a river are going to change based on uh, rainfall, but the water flows unidirectionally along with the river through it. Um, and then you can have um, fringe wetlands which grow on the coasts of very large lakes. So uh, the flow in these can be bi-directional because it's going to change with the rising lake levels. Um, some lakes, like uh, the Great Lakes, are so large that they actually have tidal action. And so in really, really large lakes, like the Great Lakes, um, tidal action will also dictate um, water flow in those environments. And it'll be back and forth bi-directional as the water levels change. So those are the three types. Now let's talk about a few different examples of wetlands. Um, you can have marshes. Marshes are wetlands that are dominated by um, herbaceous vegetation. So they're just basically wet grasslands like you see here. There's just a lot of sedges and grass that are growing here. Um, and these herons. Eager, I don't know what kind of bird that is. Don't ask me. Maybe Dr. Callum sure knows, but I don't. Um, so that's marsh is dominated, basically a wet grassland. You can have swamps, which are forested wetlands. These are actually, actually, these are two different types of swamps. This is, uh, I think this is in the Everglades because there's like ferns. This looks, yeah, there are various type of ferns that are growing here. This is a different kind of um, swamp that's got skunk cabbage growing in it. Skunk cabbage grows around here. Um, so do, two different types of swamps because they're forested. Um, and then you can have bottomland or riparian wetland, woodlands. These, riparian woodlands. Um, these are occasionally or seasonally flooded by river waters. Um, but for the most part, they're dry for most of the growing season. Um, you have sampled in a riparian woodland, um, uh, right on the coat, on the edge of Monastery Run. So you've been in one with me. Um, and then there's peatlands and mires. Um, these are characterized by an accumulation of partially de decayed organic matter. And a lot of that accumulation of the decayed organic matter is going to be because it's a uh, unidirectional flow of water into a depression. So one type is a, a fen. A fen is dominated by sedges and fens actually are fed by groundwater um, rather than by precipitation. So there's some sort of like underground spring that's feeding the water in a fen. Um, and then you can have a bog. So a bog is dominated by sphagnum moss, and these depend on precipitation for water. So I will end on this picture of my ecology class last year, sampling, um, taking soil samples out at Spruce Flat, Flats Bog. 
So here you can see all of the sphagnum moss that grows in the bottom. And um, this is, so in this bog, there's actually a little, there's like sphagnum moss here on the edge near the dock where you can walk out. And then there's some on the edge near the forest where it's slightly less waterlogged. And then there's like deeper actual pools of water off the edge of the dock that goes in here. Um, but you can see it's like these squishy parts where the sphagnum moss is. Um, here is a, a lot of predaceous plants tend to live in bogs, um, in wetland areas because of the, um, nitro and so because of the, uh, nutrient poor soil, they will eat bugs as a source of nitrogen, which is super cool. Plants that eat bugs are really cool. Um, and there's Maggie, the Friday TA. When she took my ecology class last year, that's Sydney. These other people are too blurry. I think that's Michael Cardos out there and some hip waders. But I wish I could have taken y'all out there this year. But um, that's okay. Maybe when the pandemic is over, we can do like a, uh, a, a like Tri Beta or Environmental Awareness Club outing out to the bog because y'all didn't get to go out there. Um, but you should go on your own sometime. It's stinky and it's cool and there's like cranberries and other cool stuff living out there. Um, and on that note, that concludes our lecture on coastal and wetland ecosystems. In the next lecture, we will talk about broad global patterns of biodiversity. Okay, bye-bye.